So today we're going to be talking about uh, reduced order modeling. This is from chapter 11 of the book on data-driven science and engineering. And you can find the website here, databookuw.com. And uh, I really wanted to spend some time thinking about what we can do with all of this data analytic methodology, in particular looking at feature spaces, which was some of the things we've been talking about throughout the book. In other words, ways to represent the data or representations that are advantageous. And so what we're going to talk about is reduced order models. And reduced order models are all about exploiting low dimensional patterns or features in your data to build models. So ROMs, as they're often called, uh, are often used in partial differential equations to provide what are called proxy models that are much faster to simulate than the full governing equations of a system. So that's the goal, is to find a way to take a, what's normally a very high dimensional system, find a way to simulate it to look for a space in which you can trade out your full dimensional model to a proxy model, which is much faster to simulate. So that's what the ROMs architecture is going to do for us. So here's where we start, partial differential equations. And what I'm wanting to think about here with partial differential equations is to think about some generic structure, u of t. So this is a variable that represents space and time. Uh, and so the evolution dynamics themselves are through some nonlinear, prescribed through some nonlinear operator, let's call it n, which depends upon u, its derivatives, maybe time, space itself, and beta, which represents some kind of uh, parameterization of the PDE itself. So it could be, in fact, acts oftentimes like a bifurcation parameter, but in general it's a set of parameters that characterizes the evolution equations of, the, of, of, this, of this PDE. Uh, typically this is specified on some domain, here negative L to L. So the idea here is that oftentimes, if, if this were a linear PDE, we oftentimes would have potential access to analytic solution techniques that could allow us to maybe make some progress in writing down solutions. However, when you generically have a nonlinear PDE such as this, uh, then it's difficult and we do not have general solution techniques and we have recourse then to computational methods. And that's normally what we do with nonlinear PDEs that are difficult to solve, we just say, okay, well, let's discretize or find a computational algorithm that will, in fact, solve this PDE that I cannot write down solutions for. So that's the modern way of doing these things. Um, and so let's talk about how that might work. So first way to maybe do this is through standard numerical discretization is to take the U field and discretize it into a discrete number of spatial points. So here, u is traded out, which is normally a continuous variable of x and t, is now depending upon u of x of k of t, where k goes from 1 to n. So the idea is if I have a domain, which is negative L to L, I take the U field and I chop it up into a discrete number of points, n of them, and those are the representational points for my continuous function U of x, t. So I'm doing this discretization at this point just in the spatial domain. Now importantly, once I've done this discretization, I have a way to represent derivatives in this representation using what are called the finite difference formulas. So this is fairly standard from computational sciences, which is a first derivative is exactly what we learned in calculus, which is a slope formula, rise over run. And so a first derivative in this discretized system would be, here's a very simple representation of a first derivative, is u of k plus 1, so the point in front, u minus u of k minus 1, the point behind, divided by 2 delta x. So this is a rise over run formula for the approximation of the derivative in this discretized space. Second derivative, you can follow this up with these finite difference ideas, which is the derivative of the derivative, and you get a formula something like this. The second derivative is the point in front of you, or to one side, the point to the other side, 
minus twice the current point divided by delta x squared. And so what both of these are is it gives you a way to compute derivatives as a function of neighboring points. Remember, all a derivative is is a slope, so you just have to use your neighboring points to compute that slope. So that's, that's the idea behind using a numerical discretization scheme is if I chop this up down to a finite number of points, each point, I can now start going back to that original PDE using these discretization schemes to come up with a approximation for the PDE evolution. So let's see what this would look like. So here's kind of what it would look like. This is, in fact, the evolution dynamics here now in the discretized coordinates. Now notice what I've done. I've traded out this continuous variable, u of x of t, now for n discrete points describing the u field, and the evolution of the kth point is given by the following. du k dt is equal to n now, and notice what I've done here. I've put in here the discrete values of the u field. So in other words, evaluate at each of those k points. And notice how now it depends upon neighboring points, like k plus 1, k minus 1. And it depends on those points because of the derivatives. The derivatives make it a point, a localized point, talk to its neighbors. They're related to those derivative relationships, which I showed you here, which tells you if I have a first derivative, it uses two neighbors. If I have a second derivative, it uses two neighbors plus the point itself. And then you can compute these for third derivatives, fourth derivatives. And you can even do higher accuracy schemes, which not just rely on one neighbor, but potentially two neighbors. In fact, if you wanted to get better approximations for derivatives, you would use some of these higher order approximation schemes to do that. Okay? Now, what we've effectively done is we've taken this spatial domain, u of x t, where we have some solution, continuous solution, now broken it down to a finite number of points. And so now I have this representation of that system as a discrete number of points, and I can use something like a runga kutta scheme to march this forward in time. Because now what I've done is I've traded out this partial differential equation for a high dimensional set of differential equations, which I can now solve with something like, you know, runga kutta, fourth order runga kutta. So this is the problem with actually a lot of computational schemes is uh, there's no problem with it except for, for a very large system, a two dimensional system, a three dimensional system, the, the dimension of this, of this here, in other words, the number of points you've discretized it in can get uh, very large. So in modern computing, if you're thinking about large fluid flows, you can have billions and trillions of differential equations now to model a spatial temporal system. So this is very high dimensional and typically extremely slow to run. And this is really getting at the heart of why reduced order models are important. Because what we'd like to do is find a way to approximate this further, find a way to run simulations of this system much more quickly than running this massive system of differential equations. So that's the goal of reduced order modeling. How do we take this, find a proxy model, and just like the title says, it's reduced order, which means lower dimensional, and that's what we want to get after. Now before we go this direction, uh, let's talk about a different way to discretize or numerically approximate that PDE. Uh, and this is actually going to get to how we're going to do model reduction here. So um, what we're going to think about instead of doing the discretization and finite differences, we're going to think about, well, oftentimes one of the standard solution techniques we use for linear differential equations is to do a separation of variables argument. And then the separation of variables argument is to say, take the U field, U of x, t, and separate it into time and space. So A of t contains all the time dynamics, psi of x has all the spatial dynamics. Now, one of the problems with doing such a thing is that, of course, this works for a linear system. In linear PDE theory, this is one of the standard out, uh, ways to solve uh, analytically for PDEs. But now we have a nonlinear system, so there is a question about how good could such a method be for a nonlinear PDE. But in either case, what we really want to do is take that idea, 
of this separation of variables and build a numerical algorithm out of it. Okay? And how we're going to do that is through doing modal expansions. And the way we're going to do that is think about u of x t. I'm still going to use the structure of a time-space separation, a of t, psi of t. But notice what I've done here is I've now said I'm going to represent this in terms of psi of k's and a of k's. So what the psi of k's are are going to be modal basis functions. And I'm going to explain what those are. And so what they are is a set of orthonormal functions that I'm going to use to represent the solution u of x t. Okay? And by doing this, I can basically take any of this u field and take a sum of n of these basis functions to represent my solution. So that's going to be the goal. And one of the questions, of course, will come immediately is, what basis functions should you use to make a reasonable approximation to the PDE? Okay, so oftentimes this goes under what are called spectral methods for solving PDE, which spectral methods you use some basis functions. Often it's the fast Fourier transform or Fourier modes to as a set of basis functions, uh, or Chebyshev polynomials to represent the basis functions. And by the way, Chebyshev and Fourier are used heavily because you can compute <coughs> the A of K in n log n time. So they're very fast. So both of those are very fast methods. Remember, part of what we're going after here is not just can I come up with an algorithm to solve that PDE. It's can I come up with an algorithm to solve that PDE in a very fast and efficient way because the system often tends to be extremely large. So what would we do if we have this basis expansion, this modal expansion? Well, well we'd put it back into the governing equations. And so if I do that, here's what you would get. So now what I've just done is simply taken that time-space separation solution, put it back into the governing PDE, here it is, and then to get out the evolution equations, again, it's, it's going to be just like finite differences. What I'm going to get now is some evolution equation, but now it's for the A of K terms, the, in other words, the coefficient of each of those basis functions. And I'm going to rely on one of the most important properties we have here, which is orthogonality of these basis functions. So here is your orthogonality properties. So the modes are orthonormal. So they're orthogonal to each other, and they have an inner product of one with themselves. Now if you apply that orthogonality condition here, in other words, just take this thing, take the inner product with respect to phi of m, and what you end up getting is some evolution equation here. So this is now the evolution for each of the modal coefficients. So the A of k is how the phi of k mode is evolving in time. Now what's nice about this kind of representation is the finite differences thinks about the discretization as I have a point, it talks to its neighbor. So it's very local in nature. So the error is all accumulated around that uh, local sort of representation. Here, when you do these modal expansions, you're using modal bases, which are modes that expand the entire domain negative L to L. And so each one of these modes you're doing here or evolving is as you evolve it, you're looking at its modal expansion. The, the, the error now is each mode expands the entire domain, so it's global in nature. So like it has a sort of a global structure in terms of its error versus the local, which is the finite differences. And oftentimes these spectral methods have uh, exceptional uh, properties in terms of error bounds. But that's the representation you would have. Now part of the reason I'm going through these numerical procedures, whether finite difference or something like the spectral representation, is because this kind of spectral representation is going to be exactly what we're going to go after for building reduced order models. We're going to try to find a set of modes to project our data onto. And this here is usually called a Galerican projection, which is you find a basis set you project and then you so you get the evolution dynamics of the coefficients of each mode. Okay, so it's a that's the idea is to take the full PDE, find a basis, project the dynamics into that basis. And that's the evolution equations if you do that. Okay, so what that's what we're gonna build up to 
And part of what reduced order models modeling efforts are about is to try to find out what are the best bases that you should be using to get this right. Okay, so let's talk about one of the ones we use all the time. Fourier mode expansion. And so one basis set that you could just pick generically is Fourier modes, and here's what they look like. These are your, uh, this is what the FFT is built out of. In fact, one of the really nice things about this FFT is that you can get the projection out into the amplitude space A of Ks in n log n time. So it's very fast to move from your original state space to this new representation space A of K. So this is sort of your, your, uh, your canonical go-to. It's the basis of a lot of uh, fast spectral methods. And, but one of the things that I want to highlight here is I've just generically picked this basis. And often what you do in Fourier modes, you're going to go back here and you're going to represent this in terms of n of these Fourier modes. Now oftentimes when you discretize, and if I have, I discretize into n points, I use n Fourier modes. Okay, so I still have to find a of k, and so the, my state space is still very high. The goal of reduced order modeling, at least from the point of view of the basis set, is to say, I want to be able to expand my solution in terms of a basis set where instead of using n, and n is very high dimensional, I want to be able to go to r modes, where r is much, much smaller than n. That is going to be the key idea of reduced order modeling. This here, this formula, but instead of n, r, where r is much less than n. So the idea would be then, when I solve this system of ODEs, there's r of them, not n of them, where r is much less than n. Okay, so that's going to be the idea behind reduced order modeling. Now if I do just generic basis like Fourier modes, I don't get to necessarily find that reduction space. I would just use this thing and by the way, a lot of times the, the, the value in using a Fourier transform is that it's very fast to do it. That's exactly why you would use it, because you have the FFT, which was developed in the 60s, that help us compute this in n log n time. Okay? Okay, so let me just show you, if I were to take some generic function here, a Gaussian, and project it into that Fourier mode space. In other words, if I want to use a basis expansion, which are Fourier modes, and here I want to think about representing this Gaussian, what it would look like in the Fourier modes. In particular, how many Fourier modes would I need to do a, a give an accurate representation of that Gaussian? So one of the things we've been, I can show you here, it depends a little bit on what that sigma is, but here's a chart. And I want to show you three different cases here. So what I'm showing you here is the function, which is the Gaussian. And so there's yellow, kind of a white, and a cyan. So I have a Gaussian, depending upon how I pick sigma, it's either, if, if I pick sigma to be large, that means it's a very tight Gaussian. And if it's small, then it's a very spread out Gaussian. So those are those two extremes. And because it's a Fourier transform pair, if I do the Fourier transform, something very localized in X will be very spread out in the Fourier domain. So the yellow, which is very tight here, is very broad in the spectral domains. In other words, the number of Fourier modes I would need to represent something so localized is very high. Whereas if I look at this very broad Gaussian, the cyan, so in X, it's very broad. In the Fourier domain, it's highly localized. Okay, so this is one of the properties of Fourier transform pairs. If you squeeze this way in space, it gets very broad in frequency. If you squeeze in frequency, so it's very localized in frequency, it's very broad in space. In fact, the limits are that it, if I have a delta function in X, it's infinitely broad in spectrum. If I have a delta function in in the mode space, in other words, in a single frequency in omega, it's a constant solution in X, okay? So this is this Fourier transform pairing. Um, and then I just simply say, well, okay, let's, uh, let's take, let's try to represent these by a fixed number of modes. And by the way, you can clearly see here, if you look at the cyan, which is well, it's, it's a sort of a, a very fat 
Gaussian here in the X domain. It's very localized in the Fourier domain. And I'm going to plot here on a log scale the error versus the number of modes I need to use to represent that. So notice what happens here. The cyan, which I don't need very many modes for, by the time I've got 15 modes, notice that the error is already down at 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 6. In contrast, if I take this highly localized yellow here, which is a small patch of space, very compressed, it's very broad in the frequency, and notice its air decay properties. Even at 40 modes, I haven't done that well in terms of bringing the air down. So one of the things you need to do with numerical schemes is really work on trying to reduce your error. So any localized structures in your PDE domain, it's going to cost you a great deal in representation. Okay, So this is one of the big challenges and it's partly also why simulations of many systems, especially multi-scale physics systems where you have fine scale features, cost you a great amount in computational cost because you have to resolve those features and it's going to cost you a great deal of number of Fourier modes to resolve them, for instance. And you're going to have then to take a large set of modes to get accurate representations. And by the way, this middle panel here just shows you when I look at the intermediate case, which is the white one here, and I look to see how well do you reconstruct it as a function of the number of modes. So, you know, I'm using from three modes all the way to 39 modes. And this is supposed to look like a Gaussian. And you can see with three modes, it's just this big, broad thing. As I use four, five, six, all the way up to 39 modes, it nicely shapes up into this beautiful Gaussian. So this is a nice representation of what, of what we're ultimately trying to do here with reduced order models is I'm gonna, we're going to construct a basis set to try to represent the solution. Um, and so, which is fine, except for that we're going to have to have deal with these issues around how many modes do I need to use? Because ultimately what, like you, what you'd really like to use is as few modes as possible to get some prescribed accuracy. Every mode you use here is another differential equation you have to solve, right? So um, you'd like to use as few as possible because if you look at the difference between these, the simulation of this blue one, cyan one, I could probably use 15 modes in my simulation and do a good job. Whereas the yellow one, I'm actually going to have to probably use uh, 100 or 200 modes to get the same performance and same error that I get here from the blue. So that's, that's the trade-off. So the yellow would take significantly longer, maybe an order of magnitude longer to simulate, even though it's the same function. Okay, just that I need more resolution to get it dialed in. So this brings us then to the heart of it, which is ultimately let's go back to our system. And I've written, written it a little bit differently here. And I've written it in a, in a form that often is used uh, in reduced order modeling, which is I take my PDE and I have some linear part of that PDE and some nonlinear part. So I've broken it apart now. I've now for this point, for this purpose of right now, I've just said let's put an epsilon in front of the N. In other words, let's, let's assume that the linear part dominates for a minute. And I'd say, what would we do with this if we were doing some analytics? Well, if we were doing analytic solution techniques, we would say, well, what I have here is a linear operator. And oftentimes, these linear operators have uh, very nice properties, right? We can take linear operators and find eigenfunction expansions that, uh, or eigenvalues and eigenfunctions that are representations of that operator L. So it's equivalent to taking a matrix A and finding its eigenvectors and eigenvalues. And once you have those eigenvectors and eigenvalues, you can represent your solution in terms of those eigencoordinates. And we're going to do the same thing here. Because uh, remember, what we're really after is, how do I construct the basis that I actually want to use for building the reduced order models? And so when I look at this, this is already starting to indicate or foreshadow what we really want to do with this, which is if I look at that linear part, and if I know that the linear operator has such an eigenvalue, eigenfunction expansion, then that's exactly what I'm going to do. In fact, I'm going to take that, and instead of expanding in Fourier modes or whatever generic basis set that I would have, 
I expand in the eigenfunctions of that linear operator, and when in doing so, this is my evolution dynamics. Okay, this is just a generic numerical algorithms spectral expansion methodology. So, so now I get the evolution equations, d a d k. So I'm going to do an expansion, remember, for this u field in terms of a sum of a of k's, psi of k's. And so I know what the psi of k's are. They're right here. So the only thing i got to determine is what's going on with the a of k's. And the a of k's I get from putting that expansion back into the PDE, taking the inner product, using the orthogonality properties of these eigenfunctions, and here is your evolution dynamics. Okay? So that's, the, that's, in some sense, in a nutshell, uh, what we've learned is spectral theory or spectral representation uh, uh, for solving PDEs, okay, spectral methods. That's, this, is, this is what they are. Uh, find a basis, expand in that basis, project into that basis, and get your evolution dynamics. And we're going to use this same concept in reduced order modeling. The real big deal we're going to do that is making reduced order modeling effective is we're going to be very smart about how we choose these basis functions. That is the, the entire key for reduced order modeling. Pick, those, pick the best five k's you can. Now, how, what do I mean by pick the best? I want these dA, dK, dTs. I want k goes from 1 to n. Typically, that's what you do. I want them to go from 1 to R. I want the smallest number of ODEs for me to represent that full high-dimensional PDE. So I want an R-dimensional system to accurately represent the N-dimensional system. And that's what we're going to talk about uh, in the next lecture. By the way, all this can be found here, databookuw.com. More codes, more notes. Uh, the notes are, can be downloaded here, uh, and also some code in the future lectures are all downloaded at this site.